parents ready to go? Okay, let's pray. God, we're just hungry for your word. And I think of what your son said when he was, uh, when he was being tempted that, um, that man doesn't live by uh, bread alone, but by every word that comes out of your mouth. And God, you've, just, you've designed us that your word is powerful. Uh, your word is like a rock. Your word is like a fire. It's like our food. It's what speaks and energizes our life and empowers us to live the life you've created us to live. And so we pray today as we gather around your word that you'd speak loud and clear. I pray my voice would be clear. I pray my mind would be clear. I pray that we would all gather around your, your word and that most of all, you'd give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to your church today. We pray it's in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Well, our story starts today on sort of a typical average uh, everyday morning. And uh, he gets up, and he's an attorney. He's uh, got a successful career going. And uh, if you were to ask him, you know, how is life going? Uh, it's going well. It's going well. I mean, there's ups and downs uh, like any life. Uh, his marriage uh, has ups and downs, got challenges, uh, problems. But there's nothing uh, to signal to him on this day that his life is about to change forever. And so uh, as he heads off into the day, um, he, he jumps into the, the busyness of work and so on, comes home, and, uh, and that night, uh, his wife tells him that uh, after 11 years of marriage, that she's leaving him. And there is nothing that he can do to stop. She doesn't want to do counseling. She's not open to anything. She is done, and she is leaving. And in that moment, his life is shattered. He's, uh, he's devastated. Uh, he's lost his way. He doesn't know what to do. And so recently he's been attending a church, and so that weekend he decides to, when, when it comes to the weekend, to go to church just in hope of some, some word of encouragement, some uh, kind of ray of, of sunlight in the midst of his dark world. But uh, when he gets there and worship is going, this is not working. He just feels like his walls, the walls of his life are caving in. And right there in the middle of that time of worship, he just kind of involuntarily just falls to his knees. And that's when it happens. Well, today, we are continuing this journey that we're on, this series that we started, uh, I guess it was uh, like four weeks ago called Serving Sacrificially, Discovering Your Purpose. And if you're here for the very first time, a special welcome to you. Uh, what we're doing in this series is we're asking the question, how do we discover uh, God's vision for all of our lives? How do we uncover his specific plans and purpose for each of our lives? And if you've been here the last three weeks, what we've been doing is laying uh, kind of a firm foundation for the rest of this series. And so if you're here week one, you remember we learned that when a man or woman comes to Jesus, we discover that we have been chosen before time. And not only to come to Jesus, not only to enter into a relationship with God, not only to be forgiven for our past, not only to be adopted into his family as a son or daughter, but that we have been chosen before time to play an important role in God's epic vision to bring all of creation healed and restored under the leadership of King Jesus and that he's been shaping us our whole lives to play this part that we were created to play. And then the second week we learned that uh, if we want to carry out God's vision for our life, that we have to enter into a supernatural transformation process where we learn to listen and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit so we can be transformed to be like Jesus, so we have the capacity to embrace this new paradigm, to live out a life of love that leads to a life of sacrificial service. And then last week, we learned that the key to our transformation is to learn to come under God's leadership in our life to be living not for our purpose, but for his purpose, and to take that, we call that a step of surrender. Not my will, but your will. And this is the most important step if we're going to be transformed, become like Jesus, so we have the capacity to live out this life of love that leads to a life of sacrificial service. So we've carefully laid a firm foundation that will now support this building that we're, we're building, where we're going in this series 
but we're finally ready now to begin to dive in and begin to explore and ask the question, hey, how has God shaped each of us uh, for our specific life, calling, and purpose? And what we're going to be doing is over the next, uh, next four weeks, uh, that we're going to be uh, kind of looking at five key areas of our life where God has been shaping us over the course of our life to carry out the purpose for which we were created. And to get at these five areas, we're going to use uh, a powerful, really excellent acronym uh, that was created, designed by uh, Pastor Rick Warren. It's described in his book, Serving our uh, Purpose Driven Life, that we're using in our Serving Sacrificially series. And I'm not usually a big fan of acronyms, but I really like this one because he does a great job of kind of, uh, of kind of describing these five key areas of our life where God has been shaping us. And so there in your note sheet, you have a section that's called Serving Sacrificially, Shape to Serve, and you'll see the acronym there, and the first letter is bold. And, and what I want to do is, is just introduce it briefly today, and then we'll be dumping in at the end of the service to the first, the first of the five letters. But let's jump in and fill in some blanks real quickly, all right? So, so the acronym is SHAPE, S-H-A-P-E. The S stands for spiritual gifts, right? So what we're going to see today is that when we come to Christ, or sometimes later in life, God will give us these supernatural abilities uh, to help us serve, live out a life of love that the Bible calls spiritual gifts. We'll talk more about that later. Number two, the H stands for heart. So what we'll see is that, that one of the ways God leads us and guides us uh, is, is by putting his passions, his drives, his uh, motivations into our heart. I love this story uh, that we'll look at later in the series of the man, uh, the leader, the Old Testament leader, Nehemiah, who God called to go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And when he first arrives, Nehemiah says, I had not shared with anyone yet what God had put in my heart to do for the city of Jerusalem. And so one of the ways that God leads us is by putting his passions into our heart. And so we, two people may have the same spiritual gift, but a completely different passion in how to use that gift. And number three, A stands for abilities. So we're all born with natural giftings and abilities. Like some of you are naturally uh, mus musical or naturally athletic or naturally uh, analytical or whatever. They, and so we, we all have uh, we're kind of natural abilities, talents, and skills that we've received at birth or picked up along the way. And often this plays into God's plan for our life. Number four, P, uh, P stands for personality. So we all have a personality, or at least most of us, and it's a unique personality, right? And so that our personality uh, is, is God-given, it's kind of woven into us, uh, it's part of our core makeup, and this often uh, impacts what we're called to do. For example, later in this series, we'll talk about this. Some of us are more extroverted. Some of us are more introverted, right? And so you could have two people with the same spiritual gift, like say the gift of evangelism, but the way that will work out for the extrovert, probably very different than the introvert. If you're introverted, chances are God won't call you to go door-to-door -door evangelism, right? Like that would not work out very well, probably scare more people away from Jesus than draw him to Jesus. And it would certainly scare you to death before your time. All right. All uh, right. And then number, uh, a, a great quote there by John Eldridge in his book, Wild at Heart. I love this, and it kind of speaks to the whole series. Uh, a retriever loves the water, a lion loves the hunt, a hawk loves the sword. It's what they're made for. Desire reveals design, and design reveals destiny. And so this is the idea that God has designed us a certain way, and that's often a clue to our destiny. And then finally, the E stands for experience. And so we've all had a unique set of life experiences. Uh, some of us, you know, where we were born, how we were brought up, our social economic background, our educational experiences, uh, our racial background, um, uh, uh, the hard things, challenges we've had to face in life, our different spiritual journeys. We all have a different set of experiences that often these come to play in terms of how God has created us to, to impact his kingdom, all right? And so for the next four weeks, we're gonna be looking at these 
five areas. And today, we're going to, uh, later on in the message, just take a brief look, start looking at number one, spiritual gifts. But before we jump in and look at number one, we have to address some important questions that are going to impact uh, all five areas in how we, uh, how we discover our purpose. And so there in your note sheet, the next section says serving sacrificially. And I ask a question, and the question is, what's your paradigm? Now, we've talked about paradigms earlier in this series. In fact, the second message we talked, we said if you're going to be transformed to be like Jesus, we have to embrace this new paradigm of living not for ourselves but for others. We're going to follow Jesus who came not to be served but to serve. But that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here is a a specific kind of paradigm. And what I mean by this is what is your ministry paradigm? In other words, we've seen in this series that God has this epic vision to bring all of creation under the leadership of King Jesus. And when we come to Jesus, we each have a specific part to play. But the question is, in your mind, how does this work out? How, how, does the, how, do, we, how do we carry out the vision of Jesus? How does the, the new community of Jesus, how is church, how does that work? How does ministry get done? How does the kingdom get advanced? And what I'd like to suggest today is that that for many of us, we still have what I like to describe as a two-tier paradigm of ministry. And you say, what does that look like? Well, in a two-tier paradigm, for many Christ followers, they look at like this. There are two different kinds of Christ followers. There are professional Christ followers, and then there are the people. Everyone left, right? So under professionals, we would put pastors. We would put, uh, based on your church background, priests. Uh, We would put parachurch leaders. We would put missionaries. These are professionals. These are the ones who really get things done. And the job of the people is more to uh, kind of sit in the stands and cheer them on. Like, so for example... Uh, let's, let's pick a sporting event. Uh, let's say uh, Super Bowl, right? So, so today, we're going to watch as the Super Bowl is played, uh, and the stands are going to be crammed with thousands and thousands of people, while approximately 100 people, 50 aside, are going to bash their brains out on the field, right? And so... Uh, Often, this is how we we look at the the movement of Jesus, how we look at ministry. That the job of the professionals is to play the game on the field. The job of the people is to come to the events and watch them. And then when they do a good job, we cheer. And when they don't do a good job, when our leaders drop the ball, we boo, right? Right? And so our job is to attend, our job is to kind of participate in the events that these key players on the field are performing, uh, perhaps buy a ticket to help finance this whole venture. And so this is what I would describe as a two-tier mentality, a two-tier approach to ministry. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the Bible, that the two-tier mentality is really an Old Testament mentality. And I want you to think about this. You know, if you go to the Old Testament and says, how how does does the Bible kind of portray ministry and how the kingdom advances, there's no question in the Old Testament there was sort of a two-tier model, right? Because in the Old Testament you had priests and people. And you couldn't just waltz into the temple yourself and enter into the presence of God. You couldn't just go and I'm going to offer my sacrifice. I'm going to say my prayers. I'm going to do this. No, you had to be a priest, right? And to be a priest, you couldn't even choose to be a priest. You had to be born into the right family. You had to be born into the tribe of Levi. And then if you want to be the high priest, you had to come from a certain descended line. And so So in the Old Testament, there was very much a two-tier system. Like you needed a priest to stand between you and God. Are you with me? You following this? And so catch this. The job of a priest was twofold. The job of the priest was to stand between the people and God and to represent God to the people and the people to God. 
Are you with me? That was the job of a priest, right? So that's kind of how the Old Testament, but what we learn in the New Testament when Jesus came is that this two-tier paradigm was never meant to last forever. That it was designed to be temporary from the start. It came with an expiration date. And you know what that expiration date was? About 30 AD, when Jesus died on the cross. And some of you will remember this because it's beautifully symbolized in the Bible because you remember that when Jesus died, remember in the, there was a huge temple complex in Jerusalem. Right? Remember, I, I'll, I'll just describe it. It's five football fields long, three football fields wide, holds 100,000 people for feast days. And inside the temple, the huge massive temple, there was this tremendous, very thick cloth veil that would hang down, and it would separate the holiest place in the temple, the Holy of Holies, from the kind of the outer court of the temple where just a regular priest would come. And you remember this, only the high priest could go behind that veil once a year on the Day of Atonement to make, uh, to make offering, to make atonement for the sins of the nation. But you remember that when Jesus died on the cross, do you remember what happened to that veil? It was torn supernaturally. This thick, this huge thing. It was torn supernaturally from top to bottom. And what God was saying is the two-tier system is dead. That you no longer need a priest to go before you to make atonement. Why? Because our high priest, the ultimate high priest, Jesus has come, and he has passed through the veil, the inner veil, into the presence of God, not with the blood of animals, with his own blood. And so atonement has been made, and so you and I can now go directly into the presence of God. We don't need a priest. In fact, catch this, that in the New Testament, the apostle Peter says, actually, it's even better than that, that if you're a follower of Jesus, you are now a priest. And as a priest, you have a twofold responsibility. You can go into the presence of God to pray for the people, and you can come out of the presence of God to speak for God to the people to represent him. And I want you to see this. It's there in your note sheet in 1 Peter chapter 2. And so Peter uses this temple language, and he says, you, as Christ followers, he said, you're living stone. So he's, he's building this image of like, hey, we used to have a, like a stone temple, but, but now um, you, as followers of Jesus, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fills you as, so you're like, each of you is like a living stone. He said, so you're like living stones that God is building into his spiritual what? temple, and to catch this, what's more, you are his holy what? Priest. You're his holy priest. Because of what Jesus has done, uh, we are all now priests. We all have access into the holy of holies. We don't need someone else. And we all are going to represent him to the world. In fact, a few verses down, this is what Peter says, you are a chosen people like Israel, right? You are a royal what? Priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a people belonging to God. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. So in the Old Testament, the job of the priest was to declare the praises of, of, of Yahweh. And now as followers of Jesus, we're called to declare his praises to the world, to, to stand in that place, to be a conduit of his love and grace to those who don't yet know him. Are you with me? So... So what, what this means is that as we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we're going through a major paradigm shift of what it means to be a follower of, uh, of God and to go from uh, a kind of a, the, the, old parad the kind of a Old Testament priesthood to the New Testament priesthood. Now you say, why is this so important? And here's what I want you to catch. If you do not make this paradigm shift in your life, Chances are, you may miss or be slowed down at discovering God's purpose for your life. And the reason is, God may be calling you to things that you think only priests can do. 
And if you don't see yourself as a priest of Jesus, that you will, you will not even hear that calling because you, you'll, you'll limit yourself because you don't realize who you are or what you're called to do. And so <clears throat> this leads to another question. I want to go through a series of questions here. Just one kind of leads to another. Well, if that's true, if we're all priests of Jesus, we don't need any, someone to represent us before God anymore. We don't need someone to stand between us and God. Then the question is, like, what's the role of leadership in the new community of Jesus? Is there, is there no leadership role? And the Apostle Paul addresses that question in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, Ephesians, of course, his letter to the church at Ephesus, Ephesus, fourth largest city in the Roman Empire, uh, and many Christians in Ephesus and around that area. And so he addresses this question, and what he's going to say is that God gives gifts to his church. And when he says in this context, God gives gifts, he's not talking about spiritual gifts, like we'll talk about later, but he's talking about he's going to give gifted leaders to his church to lead the movement of Jesus. Um, and, and, but we're going to see like, okay, so what is the role of those leaders, right? Because it's a very different role than, say, priests in the Old Testament. And so he says, so uh, now these are the gifts God gave to the church. And he's going to give us some examples of these types of gifted leaders. So apostles, right? Prophets, evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. And catch this. Their responsibility, like what's the job of these leaders? Their responsibility is to what? Equip God's people. Underline that. Their job is to equip God's people, and then catch this, to do his work. All right? So underline that. That the job of leadership in the movement of Jesus is to come alongside uh, the body of Christ and to equip each person to do the ministry, to, to carry out their part in unleashing this movement of what we call passionate Christ followers. And so he, Paul is going to use this analogy of the human body. Now, there are five passages in the New Testament that address this issue of spiritual gifts. We'll look at two later, five of them. This, first, this is the first one we're going to look at in Ephesians 4. We will cover all five in the next uh, three weeks, and e either here in the weekend service or in the small group serving sacrificially study. But this is the first one. And Paul, when he ever talks about spiritual gifts, he likes to use the image of the human body. So it's a very beautiful, simple image that says like, like this new movement of Jesus is like a human body, and the head is Jesus. He's the one calling the shot. He's the leader, and then the body is like all of us, like we each have a different part in this body. Some of us are arms, some of us are legs, some of us pancreas, uh, and we're like we all have an important part to play. And so he's going to use this analogy, and he says, um, so their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work, and to build up the church, the body of Christ. And he says, this will continue until we all come to such a unity in our faith, like we all grow up spiritually, and we come to a place of knowledge of the Son of God that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So the idea is Jesus is mature, isn't he? He's, he's the head, but the body, not so much. And the job is, is that for, for leaders to equip everyone to do their part in the body so that the body can build itself up and we all grow strong together and we become, the body becomes like the head. That the, so when you look at the church, the community of Jesus, say, hey, it reminds me of Jesus. That looks just like Jesus, see? And so he goes on, and he says, uh, he, uh, he says, make the whole, um, so he, talking about Jesus, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Like he, he chooses the gifts we each receive. And he says, um, as each part does its what? Okay, so underline that whole thing. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of what? Okay, so do you see what he's saying? This is how the community works. 
The job of leadership is no longer to be the priests that stand between you and God that you have to go through the priests to get to God. The job of leadership is to come alongside and equip every person in the body to discover their unique role, discover their gifting, their calling, and as everyone does their special work, the whole body builds itself up in love until we all become like Jesus. You see, that's the, that's the new paradigm. That's the one-two paradigm. And so obviously, uh, uh, spiritual leaders play an important role in this. And God gives spiritual leaders with vision and gifts and whatever they need to do to carry that out. And obviously, as a church of Jesus, we recognize those gifts and the Bible calls us to submit to our leaders and so on. Uh, and, and so there's this leadership role that's played. But catch this, that's very different than the old priesthood model, isn't it? Right? And so... Um, and so the question is, the next question on your note sheet is serving sacrificially, what are the signs? And so I want you to do a little self-analysis here, right? And so the question is, well, how do I know if I have a, one, a, a two-tier model or a one-tier model? Like the two-tier paradigm or the one? And I, and, I, and I think there are some telltale signs. And I think we're all somewhere in between this. But I think there's, there's some telltale signs that we're still working through from kind of Old Testament two-tier paradigm. So, so imagine, imagine a spectrum here. Here's the two-tier paradigm, right? Priests, you go through priests. Here's the one-tier paradigm. Yes, you're spiritual leaders, but they equip us to do our work. We're all in this thing together. And so the question is, where are you on that spectrum, right? And my guess is we're all somewhere in between, but... Um, but there are some telltale signs that we're more toward, we're still back in the Old Testament model. And so I want to give you just a few examples to get your mind going. You may think of other examples. But uh, I think, for example, my, my hunch is that uh, here at Rocky Peak, we have many of us who have come from a more, uh, I would describe it as a liturgical background. Now, this is not a negative on liturgical churches. Don't hear it that way. But you're coming from a more liturgical background. So when I say liturgical, I mean uh, churches that have a lot of ceremony, uh, a lot of maybe more ritual. Um, so this would follow, like, like churches, like some of you have come from Catholic backgrounds, or some of you come from Anglican backgrounds, or Episcopalian, or Lutheran, or some sort of Orthodox, maybe Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, or maybe uh, Armenian churches. And so in churches like this, uh, there is often uh, kind of more kind of ritual and, and kind of uh, rote things, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but also sometimes it carries with it sort of a two-time, a two, uh, two, two-tier paradigm. So for example, uh, sometimes in these churches, the leaders are called priests. Now that's okay, we're all called priests, but it often carries with it the connotation of Old Testament priesthood. Like you have to go through this. And so for example, in some of your backgrounds, uh, if you wanted to confess your sins, you needed to go to a priest. The priest had the ability to absolve you and no one else did. Like people can't do that, right? But of course in James we're told, confess your sins to one another that you may be prayed for and healed, right? So, but, but in that setting, uh, only priests maybe can uh, hear a confession and be forgiven, or only priests can administer last rites, or only priests can pray over the Eucharist, and so you can celebrate communion together, right? That, that kind of a thing. Um, now, in, in more kind of non-traditional churches, or like Bible churches, or uh, kind of Protestant churches, think churches like Rocky Peak, we can follow, we can do this too, can't we? Like we can, like only pastors can baptize. Or maybe like in a communion service, you need the pastor to pray, he needs to pray a certain prayer over the communion elements to make it feel like this is really communion. Uh, or you need a pastor, they have to come and visit you in the hospital. And so what this shows up in, in certain settings, you're like I'm really sick. Like, I'm really sick, I'm in the hospital, I might die. I don't need my life group leader here praying for me. I need a pastor here praying for me, right? Whether the pastor has gifts of healing or not. Can I tell you something? If I'm in the hospital really sick, I want someone with a gift of healing. 
I don't care what's in front of your name. Are you with me? You see? Um, and, and so, or, or so, so, hey, we're under really spiritual attack. We have to get the pastor to come pray for us. Like, I'd rather have someone who understands spiritual warfare pray for me, who's gifted in that. Are you with me on this? So we can do this, whether it's in kind of Protestant Bible circles or more kind of liturgical, uh, you know, kind of uh, settings or whatever, that we can fall into this. But it's an it's a Old Testament mindset that uh, certain people have the power, certain people have the right, certain people have this and that. But what we see in the New Testament is Jesus has come to empower all of us to do ministry, especially in our area of giftedness. Now, um, uh, what I want you to catch uh, for today is it, it's so important for us to break out of this two-paradigm two-tier paradigm uh, mentality, because if we don't, God may be calling things to do that you will never do because you can't get out of that paradigm. You don't think that, that, that you really qualify to do that. Um, and so one of, the, uh, one of the teachings of the New Testament that's so powerful that helps us to break through the two-tier mindset into the one-tier mindset uh, is the New Testament teaching on spiritual gifts. And so we're going to be kicking that off today, just kind of introducing that topic. We'll spend the next couple of weeks on it, not just because it's such an important topic, but because it helps us break down the paradigm, uh, this two-tier paradigm. And in the process, many of the lessons we learn about spiritual gifts will also apply to some of these other areas uh, that we're going to be looking at, some of these other five areas. So uh, there on your note sheet, you have a section called Shape to Serve, the S of Spiritual Gifts. And what I want to do is just begin to look at the first of this, these five areas today, this area of spiritual gifts. I'm just going to give you one principle. We're going to have six more in the next two weeks. But just start with one today. And I want to start with a basic uh, definition of spiritual gifts, uh, that kind of a working definition that, uh, that helps set us up for the next couple of weeks. So here we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it to you one line at a time. I'll talk about each line a little bit. This is just be a way to get into the topic. So first of all, a spiritual gift, fill in the first blank, is a, uh, is a supernatural ability. Right? So uh, some of you are longtime Jesus followers. You're fairly familiar with spiritual gifts. Some of us here, we, it's the first time we've ever heard of that. But So, so I want to start with basics. Like when we talk about a spiritual gift, we're not talking about a natural ability. All right? So some of you were born like with musical skills. That's not a spiritual gift. That's a natural ability. Uh, some of you are really fast. That's not a spiritual gift. Um, that's just something I wish I still was. All right, so... Um, so it's a super, so, so what the Bible teaches, catch this, is that when a man or woman comes to Jesus, either at that moment or later on in your life, that, that God gives you a supernatural ability to love others well in a particular way to build up the body of Christ. Um, and so we already looked at Ephesians 4, kind of this first of five passages about the importance of spiritual gifts. But the second one we're going to look at right now is in 1 Corinthians 12. Now, this week in your life group, you'll be looking at two, two more passages, 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans uh, 12. But in 1 Corinthians 12, the whole passage is about spiritual gifts. And this is what Paul says there in your note sheet, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. He says, now to each one, so notice that, to everyone, so everyone who's a Christian, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So notice what he calls, the, the, the whole context of 1 Corinthians 12 is spiritual gifts, but notice how he describes it, a manifestation of the Spirit. All right, so this is a, a work of the Holy Spirit, and that's why we call them spiritual gifts. Are you with me? That sometimes we just say this is a term, spiritual gift. No, we're saying a gift of the Spirit. It's a supernatural ability that's given to someone to, to, uh, to serve. Now, um, uh, when we say that, uh, let me do a quick sidebar here. What you'll notice in terms of spiritual gifts, depending on what your spiritual gifts are, 
that some are more obviously supernatural and some less obviously so. So for example, like if you have the gift of miracles and every time that you have a life group social, you turn the water into wine. First of all, I would love to be invited to your next potluck just to see how good you are. Um, but if you have the gift of miracles, that's pretty obviously supernatural, right? If you have the gift of healing, it's going to be more uh, obviously supernatural. If God is often speaking to you through visions that are sort of verified, which are like, okay, that these aren't more obvious, like that's not normal, right? But let's say your spiritual gifts, some of the spiritual gifts, and this week you'll be studying this in your, your study, uh, some of the spirits are like the gift of administration or the gift of teaching or the gift of help or the gift of service. That's less obviously supernatural. And sometimes it's even hard to tell. Is this a natural gift or a supernatural gift? And so what I want you to catch, though, when we talk about spiritual gifts, by definition in the Bible, it's a supernatural ability. Okay, uh, number two, or the second line there, it's a supernatural ability given to Christ followers. So when we talk about a spiritual gift, uh, it's not like every, everyone who's born has natural giftings, but not everyone has supernatural giftings. These are giftings that are coming from the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, all right? So it's given to Christ's followers. And number three, that there, the third thing that we want to notice is that there's uh, it's a supernatural ability given to Christ's followers to equip us to serve. And so what I want you to catch is that spiritual gifts are not primarily for us, they're for others. Are you with me that you follow this? So now, catch a spiritual gift is a gift to you, and we'll see in two weeks that when you're operating in your gift, you will grow, and you will often experience the presence of God in special ways because you're a conduit of the Holy Spirit. So your gift is a gift to you, but it's primarily a gift for others. So again, in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, from the New Living Translation, Paul says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. We saw this in Ephesians 4, that as each part does its work, then the body builds itself up. So this is where the church of Corinth got so off track. If you're familiar with the Bible, you might remember 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are all about spiritual gifts. And this is where they got off track because the, uh, the Corinthians thought their spiritual gifts were given to them as a sign of their spiritual maturity. And I'm gonna say something very important right now. So if you're asleep, it's the right time to wake up. <laughs> you do not wanna miss this. And you can go right back. You can go right back. <laughs> Ready, neon lights. There is no connection between spiritual gifts and spiritual maturity. Did y'all get that? This is one of the biggest mistakes that's made in the body of Christ. Someone has some very powerful spiritual gifts. They have strong prophetic gifts. They have healing gifts. They have great teaching gifts. They're amazing teacher, anointed teacher. And we assume that because they're so gifted, they're close to the Lord that will get us in huge danger. Because what we see in 1 Corinthians, there is no connection between spiritual gifting and spiritual maturity. And what Paul will say in chapter 13, between chapter 12 and 14, he said the mark of spiritual maturity is love. That's the mark of spiritual. You wanna tell how mature someone is? How do they love? That's the mark. And so he said, if I have the gifts, like the greatest gifts in the world, if I speak with tongues of men and angels, but I don't have love, I'm like a clanking gong. He said, if, if I have faith to move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. 
This is the mistake the Corinthians made of equating spiritual gifts with spiritual maturity and it ruined their church. And it happens all the time. God begins moving in a place and there's a lot of miracles happening and people flock to that and they start taking whatever is taught as gospel because it must be from the Lord because look at how powerful the gifts are. There's no connection. We need to measure the teaching by the word and that's different than what's going on. You see? So we want to embrace the miraculous but we don't want to take the miraculous as God's stamp on the teaching. Because that can get groups, uh, can really mess with us quickly. Now, so, so they're given, these gifts are given us uh, to, to, to serve one another in love. That's their primary. I like to compare spiritual gifts to military training. So let me tell you what I mean. Like if you have a son or a daughter, or maybe you are about to, you've just, got, you've just kind of entered into the military, you've signed up for the military, the first step is they're going to send you to boot camp or basic training. And so all soldiers go through boot camp or basic training. This is where you learn how to be a soldier. Everyone needs to know that, how to salute, how to eat, how to roll up your bed, how to shoot a weapon, how to do hand-to-hand combat. Combat. There's certain things that all soldiers need to learn, right? But then after that, you're going to go into specialized training in most cases. You're going to go to mechanic school or you're going, you're going to go to sniper school or you're going to go to communication school, or you're going to learn how to cook, or at least that's the idea. All right, so here's what I want you to catch. It's in this area of specialized training you'll make your greatest contribution. It would be a waste of time and energy and investment to take a sniper and put him in the kitchen. It might even be dangerous, right? <laughs> And we know it would be dangerous to take a cook and give them a gun and say, you're the sniper, right? So you're going to make your greatest impact in the military in the area of your specialized training. In the same way, in the body of Christ, we all need the basic boot camp. We all need to learn to follow Jesus and how to grow and how to obey and how to listen and how to follow and how to serve and live out a life of service and how to give and Uh, All these things, right? All these things that we need to learn. We all need that basic training. But your area of special impact is going to be in the area of your spiritual gifting. And it's so important that you discover it and you develop it because if you were made to be like a spiritual sniper, which is what I call prayer warriors, like if, you're, if, you're, if that's what God has designed you and we have you serving over here in some other ministry, that's a waste. Like you're gonna make your greatest impact in your place of spiritual gifting, right? So that the purpose of the gifts is, is to build up the body of Christ. Now a couple of things I wanna point out about spiritual gift under this first heading here. I wanna point out first of all that If you look through these five passages uh, in the New Testament on spiritual gifts, and in your your study this week, you'll look at two of them, and you compare them, what you'll find is there are no two gift lists that are the same. And what this suggests is that these lists are not meant to be exhaustive, like here's all the gifts. They're meant to be illustrative. It's these kinds of gifts. So, for example, I tend to believe that there's other spiritual gifts not mentioned in the Bible's list. So, for example, um, I believe there's a gift of worship, right? Uh, So, for example, um, that, that there's a gift of being a worship leader, for example. And this is more than a person has a good voice or a good sense of rhythm or a, a, they're, they're gifted on an instrument. This has a sense when someone has this gift, they have a sense of what the Holy Spirit is doing in the room. And what needs to happen during this time of worship. And they're just uniquely gifted to lead us in the presence of God. I think other people have what I would call a gift of prayer. 
So as Christians, we're all supposed to pray, but there are some believers who have a passion, a special passion for prayer. They spend much longer in prayer than, than um, uh, most people in the body. Uh, and then when they spend long times of prayer, and they may pray for hours at a time, they're very energized by that. They don't come out tired, they come very energized by that. And that they, they really, like, you know, if you want something done, they're a great person to go to because they just, they're, they're able to connect with the Lord and kind of bring heaven to earth through prayer, right? And well, there's a gift of prayer. So these gifts are not necessarily exhaustive, um, but they are illustrative of the kinds of gifts the Holy Spirit comes. And the other thing I'd say about them is that uh, one thing that's tricky about spiritual gifts is that there are no definitions of gifts. So there's no place where in the Bible says the gift of prophecy goes like this. This is what it is. Or the gift of wisdom. And that's why sometimes in different books or different uh, spiritual gift tests, you will see them defined differently, uh, especially because if your theology is involved. Like if you've been a Christian for a while, you may know this, that there are some Christians who believe that certain spiritual gifts listed in the Bible are no longer operative today. Uh, theologically, we call that position cessationism, right? Now, I don't believe that. I believe all the gifts are operative today. But if you believe that, it's going to affect the way you define gifts, right? So, for example, let's take the gift of prophecy. Uh, we see in the book of Acts uh, there's a prophet named Agabus that's used more than once to predict the future. Uh, and he, hey, there's going to be a big famine that's going to come. It's going to hit the whole Roman Empire. And so we at the church of Antioch need to take a special offering to help the church of Jerusalem. They're going through hard times. He has a prophetic gift from the Lord. Um, but like for today, like let's say that you would be more of a cessationist theologically. When you have a spiritual gift test and say, what is prophecy? Likely you'll define that as some form of preaching. That preaching is kind of like the prophetic gift today. So you see what I'm saying is that like, depend, like if, you, uh, if you're a cessationist of the gift of tongues, you might say, well, that's a gift of uh, learning, to being able to learn another language quickly to share the gospel. You might define it that way, or I would define it completely differently, more like examples you see in the Bible where people are speaking in languages they've never learned, praising God or whatever. So uh, what I want you to catch is there are no definitions in the Bible, so you kind of have to uh, make sense of it just based on the way it's described or the examples that were given uh, like in the book of Acts or from the life of Jesus, all right? So we will talk more about spiritual gifts as we go on, but the main thing I want you to catch is that the, today is that spiritual gifts, the teaching about gifts are so important because I think probably as much as any other teaching in the New Testament, they help us break down the two-tier paradigm. Because once you understand how the body of Jesus is designed, that we're designed, yes, we have leaders, but their job is to equip each of us to discover our gifts, and it's as we discover and use our gifts that the whole body thrives. Yes, leaders have an important role, but they're more like coaches on the sidelines than the players on the field in many ways. Once we understand that, it kind of breaks off. We, we go through a major paradigm shift in our life to where it opens us up to, hey, what does God want to do in my life? And it kind of breaks through some of those old uh, restrictions. And so I want to leave you with one final question. There in your note sheet. So serving sacrificially, one final question. And um, this is actually the question that we started the day with. But I want to make it personal now for you. And the question is, what's your paradigm? I, I want you to do some real uh, evaluation, self-evaluation. Remember that spectrum I talked about? Kind of the Old Testament uh, pre-spectrum, the New Testament uh, position, one on one side. And when, when it comes to, like, think through your background, Think through what you've been exposed to in terms of church. And the question is, which end are you closer to? Are you closer to the Old Testament kind of priest paradigm or the New Testament priest paradigm? Um, because it's important, I think, to identify that in your mind because if we are, don't get clear on this, if we don't get through a paradigm shift, again, it tends to shut us down. Like, let, me, let me just go off on this for a second, all right? I'm, this is not my notes. I'm going too long, but I just need to talk about this, right? Let me talk to those of you who are life group leaders, life group hosts. How do you see your role in the body of Christ? See, I see you as a spiritual leader of our church, 
And what I believe is as you go, so goes our church. That as you grow, we grow. And so I'm looking to you to lead our church, to shepherd that flock, to come alongside, to bring your, your group before the Lord in prayer, to be praying, to be shepherding. That's what I'm looking for you to do. But if you have an Old Testament paradigm, well, I'm just no one special. I've got nothing here. I've got, no, I can't do it. Real things pastors have to do. You will never shepherd your flock like you need to shepherd your flock because your paradigm is stopping you. You believe in your heart you can't do real ministry. And the reality is you have the Holy Spirit. You are a son or daughter of the king. He's called you to lead our church and you need to embrace that calling, throw off the old, break through it and become who you are. You need to lead us. You are our leaders. And you say, well, wow, I, that's a big calling. I don't know if I, yes, you have to grow up into that calling. And you say, I, I remember at my old church, you know, and I'm going on way back when we first started doing small groups. So we're going back, you know, to the dark ages. <laughs> and I remember we started that little church with 200 people. We started with seven small groups. And I remember one of the guys we asked to lead, he was on the golf course with some of the guys from the church and they're playing and he hits a bad shot and he starts to let off, you know, a less than positive expletive. <laughs> and you know what he said? He said, I gotta, I gotta change that. I'm, a, life, I'm a, a growth group leader now. And he was absolutely right. When you realize who you are and what you've been called to, it calls you to rise to a new level. Like, I can't just be mediocre. I need to be pursuing Jesus. I need to be surrendered. How can I lead my small group and call them to surrender when I'm not surrendered? I need to be pursuing Jesus in my life. And Lord, I need you to help me. I need you to transform me. And you know what? As you grow, the group will grow. Because groups don't rise above the level of their leadership. There's always a buffer zone. So as you grow, the group grows. And you know what? It's not just life group leaders. You're in kids' ministry. You're in student ministry. Wherever you are, God has gifted you to lead the kingdom of God. And the body of Christ will never become like Jesus until we all recognize and embrace our role. So, hey, we all need to grow up because the body grows as each part does its special work. And we can't do our special work if we don't know our special work. And that's why we're on this journey. To say, God, how have you designed me to serve your body so that the body becomes like the head and we live out a life of love together? Amen? Amen. Now, I want to show you the impact of this in just one person's life. Uh, it's amazing. As, as paradigms break down, the ministry that can begin to flow. And I want to share a story with just uh, a, a one man in our church. Uh, this is actually the story we started the day with. The story of this man whose life is broken, his wife is leaving him, he comes into church heartbroken, falls to his knees, calls out, right? Some of you will actually remember this story because uh, we shared it about five years ago. It actually became part of one of our, gener it ended up leading to one of our generosity initiatives. But I just want to share it as an illustration of one man's journey and what happens when we open ourselves up to God, we let go of old paradigms for whatever God wants to do. Amen? Let's uh, watch the screen. Hi, I'm Steve Gers. I work as a lawyer. My wife's name is Marion. We just got married about a month ago. I have two sons, Chris and Henry. I serve with a ministry in India called Himalayan Joy Home. 
And our vision is to save baby girls that would otherwise be killed or abandoned or aborted. And we want to raise them up as Christians and give them a home and a life. I got married in the late 80s. I was married for about 11 years. I was surprised to hear one day that my wife wanted a divorce and it was not something that I wanted. Kind of at that point, I really leaned back to the Lord. I remember going to church that Sunday after I got the news and kind of felt the walls closing in on me a little bit. And I, I remember this feeling really of dread and something caused me to just drop down on my knees and just pray to God to take away this burden from me. I really felt his presence and almost like Jesus was calling me to get out of the boat, like he called Peter to get out of the boat. And he was calling me to kind of trust in him and walk in faith. I'd been attending Rocky Peak and it was just what I needed when I needed it. I took all the essentials classes back to back and the serving sacrificially class was so much more than I expected. It helped us to really kind of identify what our talents, what our strengths were and our weaknesses were, what our spiritual gifts may be. I remember one of the women was saying that her ministry was the first thing she thought about in the morning when she woke up and the last thing she thought about when she went to bed at night. I thought, that's what I want. Yeah, I want something like that. I was able to go on a trip to Northern India with Into Focus. We were working with a ministry called Ignite the Nations, which is run by Brian and Joyce Sexauer from Rocky Peak. In that area of India is less than 5% Christian and where Christians are often persecuted and have to meet in silence and undercover. In many parts of India, baby girls are killed, abandoned or aborted just because they are girls. Everyone wants a son because a son will help with the family business, will inherit the land. Whereas a girl is a financial burden, there's still a dowry system. They're really considered second-class citizens and often abused, raped, discarded. They call them India's disappearing daughters. These girls are just missing. They're just gone as if they never existed. About a month after we were back, Brian and Joyce organized a meeting of a few of us that had expressed interest in furthering this vision of having an actual home where if someone had a baby that they didn't want, instead of killing them, they could bring them to our home. No questions asked, and we would raise them up with loving parents and education and with the love of Jesus and raise them up as Christians. And it seemed to be an impossible undertaking, so we to start praying and planning. Some of you may know that we had a building that we were negotiating to buy. Eventually the seller terminated the sale and all of a sudden we were without a building. Fast forward to October 2016 and my wife, Marion and I decided we needed to go to India to see where God would lead us. Well, it turned out that God had had a plan and had laid it all out for us as soon as we got there. He led us to a woman named Ruth, who has run a home for unwanted girls in India. It turns out Ruth had been praying about being involved with the baby's home. And she agreed to give us a couple of rooms in her home so that we could start taking in unwanted baby girls. This was such great news and really the new beginning we were looking for. Now we had a space to start taking in unwanted baby girls with the perfect parent to raise them. We were just filled with joy and we just felt this is what we want our home to represent is joy. The joy of the Lord, the joy these girls have, the joy that will flow through to everyone who visits the home and it's close to the Himalayas, it's the area, so Himalayan joy home. This is gonna be a home. It's not an orphanage. It's not a way station for the girls to be adopted or sent somewhere else. They're gonna be raised here. They're gonna have their birthdays there, celebrate Christmas there, celebrate Easter there, and go to school together. We're gonna to have loving parents. These girls are gonna be raised as sisters. Turns out God had some bigger plans for us that week. 
Two days before we were scheduled to leave, Ruth got a call about a newborn baby, five days old, born in a neighboring village that the family didn't want to keep. Next thing we knew, Himalayan Joy Home had its first baby girl. It turns out God had an amazing plan for our ministry. He just laid it all out for us on this trip, connected all the dots, led us to Ruth, brought us Cushy, our first baby girl, and we're just so excited to see what more he's going to do with Himalayan Joy Home. Isn't that an awesome story? And some of you may be thinking, oh, I could never do that. And you know, here's the point. It's not about doing that. The point is not that we will all go out and start this new ministry or we'll go to India or across the world. That's not the point. The point is, the question is, what does God want to do in your life? Whether it's serving him, as we've talked about in the series, in the commonplace, in the new community of King Jesus, or in the culture at large, what does he want to do? And here's what I, I know, is unless our paradigm changes, often his vision for our life will never be reached or it will always be compromised because we don't realize who we are and how he's gifted us to serve, amen? So the question I have for you today is what is your paradigm? Let's pray. Father, as we continue this journey, and today we just begin uh, asking some great questions about how we even see your kingdom advancing, what our role is in it, who we are as people, we pray, Lord, that you would bust through old paradigms, help us to go through a paradigm shift, that we would be open for whatever you want to do. We'd begin to understand the tremendous gifting you've placed in each of our lives and the role we play in the larger movement of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, as we worship now, as we bring our tithes, our gifts, our offerings, as we sing about new wine. God, we pray that you'd help us to break through the old wineskins, the old perceptions, to break into the new wine of your spirit. We pray it in your name. And everyone said, amen.